and that will start your writing because the biggest, the hardest part of writing a novel is writing the first word. <laughs> Hi, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. On the show, you get my conversations with peak performing thought leaders, creatives, and entrepreneurs. We explore how you can innovate through creativity, compassion, and collaboration. I believe that innovation combined with compassion and creative thinking can save the world, and I aim to bring you ways you can do it too. If you're enjoying the show, I'd be super grateful if you can support it by buying me a cup of coffee. You can buy me a cuppa at buymeacoffee.com slash Isolde T. And now, let's get on with the show. Hey there, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. My name is Isolde Trachtenberg, and I am super happy that you're here. I'm also really happy, thrilled, and honored to welcome Wendy H. Jones to the show. Wendy is an international best-selling author who writes adult crime books, young adult mysteries, children's picture books, and nonfiction books for writers. She's also a writing and marketing coach, runs the Writing Matters Online School, and is the CEO of Authorpreneur Accelerator Academy she doesn't sleep you know she's also <laughs> the president of the scottish association of writers and hosts the writing and marketing show podcast my stars wendy do you sleep welcome to the show first answer that question how many hours a night do you sleep <laughs> I, don't, I don't sleep very well actually it's probably because my head's full of um, what i want to be doing the next day mm. i ought to you know stop thinking about all these things i want to start and maybe try sleeping occasionally uh, you know, that's not a bad idea. I too don't sleep that much, but I, the, the, all of the things that you managed to, to squeeze into a day, just amazing. I'm, I'm so happy that you're here and I would love to just immediately, first and foremost, talk to you a little bit about what got you into writing? What was, what was it, the impetus that decided you that you needed to be a storyteller? I've always been a storyteller, really. I started reading very early. I was reading when I was three years old. And my mother, who was a secretary and believed in education, believed in reading, she um, bought me a typewriter when I was about seven or eight. I mean, most kids get dolls when they're that age, but I got a typewriter. Mm -hmm. And I used to write stories then. And then I, you know, you go through schooling and it kind of half puts you off writing stories. And you then, because you're having to do it all the time for education. Then I... I um, I went into the Navy as a nurse and, and then in the Army as a nurse and I was traveling all over the world. So I continued to write about what I was doing. And I always loved writing. I always loved telling stories. I always loved writing stories. And when I, I became ill with my lungs, uh, I was very badly ill. I was fine when I was sitting down, but when I stood up, my oxygen levels dropped hmm. so low that they weren't really conducive with life. So wow. one of the things you can do when you're sitting down is write. <laughs> you, don't, you don't need to be up and wandering around to actually write stories. So that was what got me started, really. Wow. Amazing. And I'm so glad that, that you seem to have dealt with all of those breathing issues. Uh, not having enough air, not being able to breathe is just the worst. So yay that I'm you're healthy. I'm fine now, by the way. Whatever was wrong with me, it went on for years and then it just disappeared. So wow, it came mysteriously and went mysteriously. <laughs> That's that, that dreaded word, idiopathic. I hate that word. We don't yes. know why it's here. We don't know where it came from and we don't know what to do about it. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so so you you tell stories and yet you also help other people tell their stories. And there, there are some people who say there's nothing new under the sun, but I think everybody has a story that they want to share. How do you help other people bring out their stories? Well, it's first of all, I help them to believe in themselves because people will go, oh, I can't write. And mm. you'll go, well, I'm sure you can, but you, you can write something. Have you ever written a letter? Yes. Well, you can write. Have you ever told a story? At, we're very big storytellers in Scotland. We tell mm. oral stories. And I said, have you ever told a story about what you've done in the day or something funny you saw when you were out? And they said, yes. I said, well, writing is just doing that, but putting it into words. Mm. And so you've already got the words there. If you can speak then you can write it down even if it's speak it into a a, a mic then mm -hmm. you can write it down 
And I also, I mean, I'm an, an NLP uh, practitioner, ma master practitioner and uh, trainer, um, which is Neuro Linguistic Programming. Mm. And I've I use that to help motivate people because it's to help them rethink things. Because to be honest, your brain's going to believe whatever you tell it. If you tell it you can't write, then you won't be able to write. If you tell it you can write, then it will, you'll be able to write. Your brain believes anything you'll tell it to believe <laughs> is what the issue is. So, you know, it's an organ that can be controlled by you. So I do a lot of motivational things with them and I get them started in a very small way. I do sessions on, you know, how to write a killer first line. And because people go, well, what do I, how do I start? And I said, well, you literally start by getting a pen and a paper and then you write something on it. And it doesn't matter what you write on that piece of paper or what you speak into your computer or whatever because it doesn't matter you can start with once upon a time there was a little girl you know and just mm. go from there you can start anywhere i mean mine are a bit more my first lines are usually you know how did i find myself standing in a frozen scottish wood staring down the uh business end of a browning pistol but you don't have to start <laughs> with a first line like that you can start with any old first line and go back and work on it because there's a saying that you can't edit a blank page and it's true you have to write something down to be able to craft it into something else so just write anything <laughs> i love that what a great bit of advice i've also heard the advice start with the second sentence don't start with the first because yeah. the first one gives gives us all this ah uh, fear but the second sentence uh, you've got the second sentence so start with the start with the second one that's the <laughs> That, that's the advice you don't that know I where your story starts start in the middle nobody says you have to write it in chronological order oh for sure that's that's an, you're just full of great and gracious wisdom I love that yeah it's true you don't know and sometimes it goes in places where you weren't expecting to go and you oh, have to you have to pivot you have to make changes so that's when you the characters that do that to you I have to say they stroll in unbidden and refuse to leave <laughs> for sure and how how do you how do you handle that? What what happens when a story you're writing goes somewhere that you didn't intend? I tend to run with it because the characters of the characters in the book will shape what you're doing, and I really believe in that. Mm. So, um, if they decide they want to go off down a rabbit hole, you need to follow them down that rabbit hole. Now, not too far, or you're going to go way out of it. But I had a couple of Russian thugs stroll into the second book in my Detective Inspector Shona McKenzie mysteries. They're still there in book seven. I can't get rid of them. <laughs> they literally strolled in and decided they were part of the story. And they became a part of the story. And now my detective can't move without tripping over them, whatever she's doing. You know, she's all over her ca their cases like a rash. You just have to run with it. You have to run with things like that. Um, my Cass Claymore mysteries, um, Cass Claymore was, uh, is the main character and she's great. She's, she's a redheaded motorbike riding ex-ballerina who inherits a private detective agency. <laughs> but then there's another character strolled in and said he was staying. And I'm like, no, you're not staying. You're nothing to do with my book. But he's now her sidekick. And he's an ex-con dwarf called Quill, Cameron McQuillerin, and he gets called Quill. Now, he turned up because her um, best friend, Lexi, is actually trying to get places for people who come out of prison to work. So she just lands her with this ex-con dwarf called Quill. And he's brilliant. He's a ladies' man, and he's not leaving. And I don't want him to leave anymore, but he was never part of the story. But now there's two people running the detective agency. You just have to run with it and it'll take you great places. As long as you have the courage to do it. So when you're when you're writing and you see someone like Quill show up, I love that you are courageous enough to go, okay, Quill, what have you got to say? What do you do in those instances? Is there do you have a practice that kind of goes, okay, I'm just gonna have to run with it? Or is are are you ever in that space where you have to talk yourself into or out of where you thought the book was going to go. Yes, yeah, sometimes you will, the book will go in a strange direction and you think, this is really not working. I need to drag it back to where I really wanted it to go because when all's said and done, yeah, the characters are great and they do take over, but it's the author that's actually writing them. <laughs> so, 
um, they need to fit into the story. So if something came in that didn't fit into the story at all, then you would um, you would you have to bring it back. You really do have to bring it back. That's important. But I think you you know on the whole, most of the things that have happened to me. I've had, the, as you say, the courage to run with them and see where they would take me. Now, mm. if Quill hadn't gone anywhere, I would have just had to delete the part where he was there. Well, not delete it. You never delete anything. You cut it and put it in a different file because you never know. Quill might not have worked in that story, but he might have had an entire series of books for himself later. Mm. Mm -hmm. So cut it out, put it in a different file that says for the future or whatever you want to call it, and then you just run with it at a different time. So yeah, that's how I do it. That's a great idea. I, I have a I have a, a file like that that that's full of scenes and people who I couldn't use for one book, but then my goodness, I'm going to use them for another or a later book. I've had that happen too. So you write, I I see that you know you write children's books, you write adult crime. When you're writing a series, because at least you have at least two series, probably even more, but with the Shauna McKenzie and with the Cass Claymore. Do you often find yourself going, oh, this didn't isn't maybe for book two, maybe it'll be for book six or or something that you thought was going to be in book six shows up and won't let go until you get it down in book two. How do you how do you make all of those plans across the series or do you fly more by the seat of your pants? I am a bit of a fly by the seat of the pants, but there's obviously a story arc that goes through all of the books to do with the characters mm. um, that goes through all of the books. Um, and maybe sometimes a character will come to a natural end and then you get rid of them. But for example, I wanted um, my next book, which is called Killer's Curse, is set in Dundee and New Orleans. So, of course, they're so close to each other. And we're talking Dundee, <laughs> Scotland, not Dundee in America. So they're... Um, they're set in both places now I really wanted that to come into about book four or five but it didn't work out so it's happening in book um, seven instead so I had to park it and come back to it because we weren't quite at that stage where we would be able to use that storyline so you do have um things that can't be parked and used later on. And you also, you have to have a story arc that goes through the whole um, series. Otherwise, your characters are never growing and developing. They're never, never moving on. They're just the same characters in every book. So they obviously have to grow older and do different things because if they stay the same people, they're not, um, then people will get bored. The, the readers will get bored. Hmm. Um, like I've got a couple of, coppers that are always scrapping with each other in books one and two but if they were still doing that in book seven then the readers are going to say have they never learned anything if they never grown up why hasn't di shona mckenzie kicked them out of the team you know so they have to mature they have to develop and although they sometimes kind of break out in a bit of sparring it's not as bad as it was in book one and two so you have to think about things like that as well and it makes a lot of sense because to me, I think of the TV show, The Simpsons, that's now going on 32 years and wow. the, yeah, it's crazy. And they're, and the kids are all still in the same grade and the baby has ever, has never spoken, you know, and, and, and it's yeah. been 32 years. So, so I, I, realistically, of course, that's not possible. They would be having their own kids by now. And yet in, in literature, there is this notion of, letting your characters breathe if you will and so as a as a writer when you're when you're creating this and you're coming up with new ideas and and your characters are developing what happens in that space of creativity how do you approach your creative muse if you will is it is it through a routine is it i'm going to sit down and i'm not going to get up until i've written 16 chapters what is your process to honor that creative muse and also the routine that you that you do it with? 
Yeah, I've got a more of a routine now than I ever did because we're all in lockdown. Mm. <laughs> so I'm a bit of an anytime, anywhere, any place girl when it comes to writing. So I had my laptop with me everywhere. So if I went into town and I was meeting someone and I was in a coffee shop and I could sit and write there while I was waiting for them or um, I would write on planes, I would write on trains because I was never at home. I was always flying around the world, you know, speaking at conferences or uh, going somewhere else in Britain to speak at a conference or going to a conference to attend it. So I was or going to a book signing. So I was always out and about. So because of that, I was in any time, any place, anywhere. I could get up at six in the morning and I could write. Um, and I could then get on with my day doing other things if necessary. But it's become more of a routine because obviously I'm not going anywhere. I don't going from the sitting room to the kitchen doesn't exactly involve a train or a plane. So I actually, <laughs> um, you know, I, at the moment I'm writing in my sitting room at a bureau. And that's because it's too cold in my office um, because it used to be a garage. And when it gets a bit warmer, I'll move back into my office um, and I've got a computer in there. So um, I am sitting down and I am writing most of the day and then having the evening off. But that's unusual for me because I tend to fit it in. And I've got a muse that will show up anywhere. I have to say, they say that, um, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I can't, um, I can't write unless you know i'm in the creative zone or something and there was one famous very famous author said oh i can't write unless i'm in the creative zone so i make sure or my, I, until my muse shows up so i make sure it shows up every time i sit at my computer to write <laughs> that's a great way of looking at it absolutely yeah yeah so let I, this is i'm i'm loving loving getting your perspective on this and it sounds like you've made it your you've made your work fit your life and your life fit your work. What did you have to do to allow that? I mean, you used to be a nurse, you lived all over the world, you spent time in Israel, you've done all of these amazing things. Yeah. And and yet you had to get to the point where you could go, you know what? This is what I'm dedicating my life to. What did you have to do differently? How did you make that happen? Well, I wouldn't I wouldn't um advise anybody else doing this because it happened because I got so sick <laughs> and oh. I had to, I, I retired early and but what I had to do was then make a conscious decision what that did was slow me down and because it slowed me down I thought what am I going to do with the rest of my life I'm not even 50 yet that was when I you know started writing and I thought what am I going to do with the rest of my life and I thought well I've always wanted to write a book so I signed up for something and this is, I would recommend people do this now from the rest of it I'm only talking about don't get ill the rest right. of it yes please do um slow down and think do I really want to be a writer now I did so I thought well I'm going to do NaNoWriMo which is National Novel Writers Month Mm. And it happens in the month of November. Now, I know we're only in February so, or March, so it's a long time yet. But you can do Camp NaNoWriMo, which is in April. And what you do is you pledge to write 50,000 words in a month. Mm. So you get 30 days to write 50,000 words. And I thought, oh, well, I can do that. It's only 1,666 words a day. That's doable. And I did it, which then gave me the bulk of a novel. And I thought, well, I'm from Scotland. And we don't give up easily, really, in Scotland. And I thought, oh, well, I might as well finish it, you know. So I finished it and then thought, well, what do I do with it now? And then I gave it out to people to read and to say, what are your thoughts? Now, one thing I will say that I did alongside that, I just didn't think, oh, I'll write a novel and then just kind of keep it to myself. I told the entire world. I wrote a blog post. I told all my friends. I put it all over social media. And the reason I did that, there was then like millions of people holding me accountable. Mm. So they were holding me accountable to writing this book. And I felt I had to write it then. Whereas if we all think, oh, I'm going to write a book, I'm going to write a book, I'm going to write a book. But we never tell anybody and we never got around to writing it. But I did have to free up other things. I literally stopped working. Now, again, I wouldn't recommend anybody does that because most people feel like eating and, you know, enjoying paying them rent mm. and gas and electricity bills is important. So <laughs> I was just in a fortunate position that mm. I was able to do that. Um, because of uh, I had money coming in anyway. Um, and 
I was also very fortunate that my first book did extremely, extremely well. And I've been able to make a living out of this. Not everybody can make a living at writing, Mm -hmm. but I try to help them be a better writer so they can make a living at their writing. What a wonderful and beautiful motivation you have there that you're you're trying to help people be better writers so that they can make a living at it. And and that brings me to something that I would love to to chat with you about. This is after all the Innovative Mindset podcast. So so what does that mean to you to to help others but in 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 ways that they might not have thought of in more innovative ways? What is that how does that look for you? What is that for? Well, I'm quite innovative anyway. I've always been innovative. I'm an early adopter. So if there's a computing program that comes out, I'm your woman. I'm on it before anybody else has even Mm. heard of it. You know, so, but I try to help them be innovative in a lot of different ways. I run, first of all, I'm a writing coach. So I do one-to-one coaching Mm -hmm. and I will help them develop as writers. I will help them do, uh, but I also run the Entrepreneur Accelerator Academy, uh, which is a membership and people, um, will join and they then get various exercises to do. I get them to think about, um, you know, words. And for example, one of the sessions I did was literally about strong, uh, using stronger verbs because we're all very, we're all very good at saying we're very good at things, but we should say we're outstanding or, you know, instead of slapping very on, because we're all lazy, we're lazy in our speech. We all Mm. are, no matter who we are, we're lazy in our speech. And we'll say, oh, that was very good. What you mean is that was outstanding. It was excellent. So I'll get them to think about word choice. I'll get them to think about Mm. sentence structure. And I do it in a fun way. So it's not boring. And then people will go, oh, well, all I need is a thesaurus and I go no you need to train your brain make your brain bigger make your brain think differently you know put the thesaurus down thesauruses are brilliant and I use them but you need to put them down and make your brain think about different words I try to expand their view of writing expand their view of what they can actually do um I use um motivational techniques that are based on NLP to help them think differently to help them I've got a book called motivation matters and it's 366 exercises to help you write and to be a better writer and to expand your creativity and there's one for every single day of the year and plus one for the leap year and i'll say things like right i want you to go and find the highest building in your city and go to the top of it and look at your city from there Or if you're in the country, go to the highest point that you can in your country. I did have one person in New Zealand, not New Zealand, sorry, in um, the Netherlands point out to me that there's nowhere really very high in the Netherlands. And I said, well, maybe (laughs) your roof then, you know, because the Netherlands is a different kettle of fish. I can't do anything if it's a flat country. (laughs) But then I'll say to people, get down low and look at it from that perspective. Lie on your front and look at the flowers. Look at what's around you. Look at the earth. Pick it up and feel it. And that will give a greater depth to your writing so I bring in so many different techniques I get them to listen to music I get them to um, do adult coloring books to do drawing to do painting lots of different techniques and get them to really look at what they're doing look for specific colors when they're out and about because that will make them observe things differently sit in a coffee shop and just listen to what's going on around you what are people saying you'll be better at dialogue then Plus, you get some really good plot lines. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I have I have a thing I've been keeping track of for years called overheard. It's things that I've overheard in coffee shops or walking down the street. I have a great memory for that. So I've written down over 50,000 words of quotes of things that happened for that very reason, because it does inform your writing for sure. Motivation Matters sounds like an amazing book. I'd love to put that in the show notes because that notion of, of harnessing creativity to be creative in another way is fantastic. How did you come up with that? Well, it's all based on NLP, uh, Neuro Linguistic Pram- uh, Programming. And uh, as I say, I help people with that anyway. But NLP is about doing things differently, even down to, I mean, uh, if you get up in the morning and you always do things, you, the, the saying is, um, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. So if you're sitting mm. down at a blank screen and you uh, page and you can't write anything, 
and you're like, I, oh, I can't do it, I can't do it. Do something differently and you'll wake your brain up. So if you always brush your teeth with your right hand, brush them with your left hand. If you always drink tea, drink coffee, don't make yourself sick, by the way. If coffee really makes you ill, don't do it. But, you know, vice versa. Do different things. If you do, Sit in a different place. Sit in a different place in your house and write at the moment. Normally, I would say go to a coffee shop or a library or a park, but you can't do that at the moment. You're a bit stuck. But go to mm. a different room in your house, a different area in your house. Sit on your bed and write. That's not very good for your back, so don't do it for too long. I don't want anybody <laughs> to end up with back and blaming me. No, no, no. I don't think that would happen at all. Well, well, okay, so you have embraced, uh, you embody this this creative fervor, which I just love. What about people, and you might get this with your own clients, what about people who think that they're not creative, that they're not innovative? They might want to tell a story, but they're not sure that they have that creative spark in them. I think I think everybody does, but, but some people who want to feel like they don't have it, what do you say to them? Well, to be honest, the people that think they can't do something, it's usually because somebody's told them that. Mm. As children, we believe we can do everything, yeah? So we believe we can draw, We believe, because we can, we can draw. Um, we believe we can color in because we color in. We believe we can, you know, use words because we play word games like Scrabble and everything. We, we tell stories to our parents. Children are so creative. Mm. And then adults beat it out of them when they get a bit older or their peers beat it out of them when they get a bit older because they'll say, oh, that's boring, you're writing, or that's boring, you're reading. Or an adult will say, why are you still coloring in your 12 now you should have got over that or you know your, your parents will say you should be right you should be doing your homework not sitting writing stories do your maths homework or so it's usually been driven out of them because people say they can't do it or somebody at school their art teacher will say you can't draw well how do they know you can draw you might not be able to draw to pass your art exam which is what they want you to do yeah somebody will say to you yeah. oh you can't write your english teacher usually sorry if you're an english teacher or an art teacher i love you to bits none of my none of my <laughs> teachers said this to me but they'll, what they're saying is not you can't do it what they're saying is it's not right what you are doing there is not right for you to pass the exam i want you to pass yeah and but your brain hears, I can't draw, I can't write, I can't paint. And we just give up being creative. And the busyness of life gets in the way. And the other thing that gets in the way, with all due respect, with everybody, me included, is social media. Mm. Because you'll, I have the amount of people that say to me, oh, I don't have time to read anymore. I don't have time to write. And I say, well, can you pull out your phone? And this is one of the exercises in my Motivation Matters book. Pull out your phone and look at how much time you spent, how many hours per day you spent on your phone or your mobile device last week. So they'll pull it out, they'll look up the stats and they'll go, oh my goodness, I spent five and a half hours on my phone every day. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So you're creative, you're just doing it a different way. Right, right. Absolutely. I, I'm so fascinated by what you were just talking about, how the teacher, art teacher, English teacher, uh, and again, no offense to teachers, off, they have to teach to the test they're Absolutely. required to. Uh, but but that, that notion of you're not doing it right in order to pass the test, what do you think we can do about that? Maybe as adults, we have to go back and, and, and retrain ourselves to think differently. But what about teachers? What about students? What is what is available to them in the moment, do you think, that would, would help them? Teachers are, are very constrained because obviously governments set the agenda mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they set the tests and they have to help people to pass the tests because that's what gets them to university, that's what gets them jobs and so on and so forth. This mm -hmm. is what's happened, yeah? The, when I went to school, there wasn't. I, I, we did one test when we were 12 and then we had to do tests at secondary school when we got to, you know, but... It was a there was more freedom for creativity mm. now i believe that some of the and 
some of the Scandinavian countries have a less, less focus on exams and they have more freedom to allow people to explore what they want to do. And there is a type, I, I have a, a master's in education mm -hmm. and there is a type of education um, where you can actually just let the child develop and do what they want. And they will still meet all the criteria that they need to meet in terms. So if you've got them, if you want them to learn money, then you set up a shop and let them run a shop. They'll learn money, they'll learn counting, they'll, add, mm. they'll adding, subtracting, multiplying. You know, if you buy, if they've got five oranges um, and they're three pence each, how much is it going to cost? That's multiplication. So children will learn by doing that. You know, if you want them to learn writing, let them write stories, be creative, tell stories to you. And we can still incorporate that, all of that into our um, teaching to a certain extent. But again, it is driven, it's governments that need to change. And again, I'm not, I'm not a politician, but I would like hmm. to see governments re-look re at the way they do things and the emphasis they put on different things. Now, again, I'm not a teacher. I cannot, I do have a, a master's in education. I ran educational programs. I, re, I ran teacher training programs. I was the manager of a, a university faculty that dealt with education. Um, but I, um, I, I do believe that there needs to be a fundamental change in the education system. But I'm not a teacher and I'm not getting at teachers and I'm not getting at the education system. So please don't think I am in any country at all, because everybody has difficult decisions to make, you know. For sure. Uh, I'm a teacher. I go into schools and teach all the time. And yeah. I'm a, there's a difference between being a regular cast member and a special guest star. The regular cast members, the teachers yeah. who are doing the heroic work of day in and day out full time classroom work are incredible because they, they have, as you said, all of these constraints placed on them about what they are required to have done by the end of the year. Yeah. And yet I know I do I do know teachers who are innovating and doing things differently and sometimes yeah. bucking the system, if you will, uh, of their school district or, or the state or the area where they work in order to be able to do that. And and yet this this notion of creative thinking and allowing children to express themselves freely, that's what leads to innovation and that's what leads to incredible progress, I think. So so when you're working with adults and they are trying to get into that space, how do you help them look for ways, what do you do to help them look for ways in which they can innovate, particularly if they think they aren't? Well, for a start, if they're, if they're wanting to innovate in terms of being a writer, the first thing I tell them to do is read and read widely. Now, reading, I'm a reader and I read. I've been a reader since I was three. I've mm. read my way through I don't know how many books. I mainly read mystery. Funnily enough, that's what I write. Um, <laughs> Love reading, but I stretch myself and I deliberately force myself to stretch myself in terms of my reading. And I run a, a reading challenge, and this is uh, nobody needs to join the reading challenge, they can if they want, but all it is is the reading challenge is that it's a Facebook group and there are 35 um, different categories, and people just read a book in that category. Now, the categories are things like a book with a yellow cover mm. or you know, a book by um, a, a classic book or, um, you know, a book set in China, a book set in Scotland. There are things like that. I can't remember mm -hmm. what the 35 categories are. A book, a historical fiction. And it's to try and stretch people. Now, I always tell people if they want to be a writer, you first need to be a reader and you need to read widely because you will get a grasp of words. You will get a grasp of sentences. You will absorb it. And you will then start to tell stories. You will start to be innovative because you've got all these stories in your head. You've got all the rhythm of the writing in your head you've got all the sentence structure in your head and you, you absorb it when you read so the first thing you have to do is read um, and this the second thing you have to do is fall in love with words just absorb words listen to people listen to what they're saying speak to people ask them about their stories tell your stories tell people stories about your day and I encourage them to tell me stories. So 
what's happened to you recently that's been exciting? You know, oh, what did you do yesterday? What's the silliest thing that's happened to you during lockdown? You know, and people will start to tell you their stories. And the mm -hmm. more they tell stories, the more they will become creative writers because they're doing it all the time and they're developing it. But they don't know they're developing it because they're doing it in such a natural way. It's so interesting, this notion of developing it without even being aware of it, because it's almost like you trick yourself, right? You trick yourself yeah. into thinking that you're not really doing anything special when you're doing something to me that's that's world changing because you're changing the way you think and the way you approach things. So when a writer does that, when a writer transforms that space from one of lack to one of possibility, what's their next step? What are the things that a writer, if you accept that you're a writer, what are the things that you need to do first? outside of reading, outside of, of falling in love with words, concretely, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to write a book, what do I do? Well, first of all, you need an idea. And ideas come just by, you can go out, go for a walk, you can go to a coffee shop, you're allowed to go for walks at the moment, um, <laughs> you can sit in the conservatory, you can sit in the back garden, and just sit with a notebook and write about what's going on around you. And that will start your writing because the biggest, the hardest part of writing a novel is writing the first word. Mm. <laughs> and that is absolutely. But observe people, observe people around you. What are they doing? What's happening? When you're reading the newspapers, think of things. Oh, that's, that would make a really good story. You know, and then write a story about it. Or use, um, I use different objects. I go into schools and I help children uh do creative writing mm. well I do when we're allowed to nothing's sure. happened the last year but I go into schools and I take objects with me and I take the most bizarre objects with me and I also take about five or six different hats and I tell stories with the different hats on and I let the child put the hat on and I take objects and I say right I want you in little groups to make up a story and I will give them three of the objects or they'll come and cho choose three of the objects mm -hmm. and they will tell a story about that you know and I've got all sorts of stories I've got you know about pirates about um about angels about fairies about um you know people going to the supermarket you, anything if you go to the supermarket just watch around you people you know that you can get road rage in the supermarket mm. seriously you could write a story i've written a short story about road rage in a supermarket <laughs> you will get ideas from everywhere everywhere you know because things happen the problem is that life is usually stranger than fiction and if you put something in your book that really happened in real life nobody will believe it <laughs> and that's the truth <laughs> For sure, absolutely. I've put I've put real things and into into my fiction books and and have been told there's no way there's no way this could oh yes no it actually did, and yeah. it, it's true. I I love that notion though of teaching kids uh, tell tell a story based on the hat you're wearing. It it's such a change in perspective because it allows play, and when you talk about neurolinguistic programming, that's one of the things that I actually really enjoy about NLP is that yeah. it, it encourages in many ways it encourages play so outside maybe when you're not on lockdown what do you do for play what are your fun things that you do well I like going to I like going to we've got a huge park called Camperdown Park in Dundee which is amazing it used to belong to the Earl of Camperdown and it's his estate but it mm. now belongs to the people of Dundee and we can go and do walk around it and things so I do things like that I like going into the country I like traveling I like visiting historic places which is good if you live in Scotland because we've got a lot of history mm. I'm fascinated by history as well I love traveling the world I love um, meeting new people uh, I'm always traveling the world and I'm very fortunate because I get to go and speak at conferences and things and do book signings and then I can just stay for an extra week or two and do a bit of sightseeing. So I love meeting new people and meeting people from different, um, you know, different backgrounds and getting to know them and what they do. And I love, I love cooking. I love, um, I love eating out as well. Um, <laughs> You know, I've got loads and loads and loads. I spend a lot of time at libraries. <laughs> um, I go to places like the um, 
the National Library of Scotland mm. and the um, the British Library, mm. um, and I do research there and things like that. So you know, I've never got a minute really. <laughs> <laughs> no, it sounds like you really don't. You're 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 definitely living a very beautiful and wonderful and full life. I I love that you go to libraries. My favorite place to write. I live in New York City in the USA and I love going to the main branch of the New York Public Library to the top Whoa. floor and that's where I write. It's fantastic. I was it, in New York 2 years ago and um, I was I was in America for 8 weeks. I was doing a book and speaking tour and I went up to stay with a friend up in New York for a few days and she said what would you like to do? And I said well I want to go to the Statue of Liberty obviously. I said but I want to go to the New York Public Library. Uh, <gasps> oh my goodness. Isn't it gorgeous? Such a beautiful amazing place. Ah and my other favorite place is the Library of Congress. Mm. I know that's not in New York. I know that's no. in Washington. <laughs> well, I my next book, it's so funny how many things we have in common. My next book is a, is a mystery novel, and my detective's name is Cassie. Not Cass, but Cassie, based on Cassandra. So when I read about Cass Claymore, I was like, oh, that's so cool. <laughs> and, uh, and there's a scene in the book that takes place in the... Thomas Jefferson Building of the Library of Congress. It's I've been there because I used to live in D.C. I love it, love it, love it. So can I so, say Cass? Her, she's short for Cassandra. Really, the yeah. same. <laughs> yeah. That's so funny. Yeah, Cass and Cassie. I love it. I think they're very different people, but uh, but definitely have some oh, of the same listen, spark. If anybody <laughs> like my Cass, they need to get a life because my Cass is hopeless. <laughs> She's and yet, the most useless detective known a man. It's really the her sidekick that does all the detecting. <laughs> and yet they solve the case by the end of the book. So they there do, you go. They do. <laughs> so what's next for you? What's coming up next in in your life and in your work? Uh, well, in my life, I hope I get out of the house at some point. Uh, that would be yes. marvelous. <laughs> I'm meant to be. I don't think I will be, but I'm meant to be on a twelve week book and speaking tour to the states later this year but i can't see it happening mm. um i'm i'm very fortunate this is uh, we're recording this earlier but i'm getting to speak at some very um interesting conferences coming up um and that's good all online i'm get i've been invited later in the year to do um some visits to writing groups and things they're hoping that they'll be back online by then and to speak at conferences um, I've also I've also got a couple of books coming out. Um, one called Killer's Curse, which is the seventh book in the Detective Inspector Shona McKenzie mysteries, and that will be out uh, hopefully by the end of April. And it's set in Dundee and New, or New Orleans. Um, the second uh, Cass Claymore book is imminently out as well, and that's called Blood and Bones. Um, and again, she'll be absolutely hapless in that one as well. She's a bit of a, <laughs> I, this is an American podcast. So I will say that if you've ever read um, Stephanie Plum books, Janet Ivanovich's Stephanie Plum books. Absolutely. All the Americans describe Cass as a, a, a Scottish Stephanie Plum. <laughs> I love it. You know, it's interesting. I'm I'm literally in the middle of rereading Turbo 23 right now. So oh, <laughs> the 23rd well, I've got Turbo Stephanie 23 Plumbo. sitting on my book pile from the library that I got out before my before the library shut down again. Wow, that's so funny. So many little things we have in common. I love it. Yeah. I love it. So Wendy, I'm I'm super excited and I want to make sure that we have all of your uh, books and things in the show notes, links to them where people can 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 get them. But do you, do you mind going through and, and saying where someone someone wants to buy a Shauna McKenzie or a Cass Claymore book? Where should they go? And also, I would love it if you would give your social media and perhaps some of the other writing resources that you have so that they're I'm going to put them in the show notes, but I'd love it if you would say them also. Excellent. Well, I'm very easy to find because I'm Wendy H. Jones. Now, I have to say, you have to remember the H in the middle of my name. If you forget it, you will end up with some woman that wrote The Sex Lives of English Women. Oh, my. That's not me. I know nothing about <laughs> The Sex Lives of English Women. Uh, sorry, you can cut this out if I'm not allowed to talk about it. <laughs> You're but, absolutely uh, allowed to talk about it, for sure. Yeah. But anyway, I'm Wendy H. Jones. So my website is wendyhjones.com. 
if you uh, if you go into any bookshop anywhere in the world, you can buy my books and you just say, have you got a Wendy H. Jones book? And even if they haven't got it, they'll be able to order it. I know this for a fact because I went into the Barnes & Noble on, I've forgotten the street in New York, but the huge Barnes & Noble on the main shopping street in New York. I think that's I went, Fifth I, Avenue. I, I, sorry? Fifth Avenue. Fifth Avenue, that was mm-hmm. it. I have a terrible memory for directions so I can never remember streets and I went there on Fifth Avenue and I uh, asked if I could buy a Wendy H. Jones book and they said yes so I was frightfully delighted Um, so you can buy them anywhere in the world from a bookshop Uh, you can get them on Amazon as an ebook and uh, paperback you can get them uh, on any ebook platform in fact anywhere good books are sold if you want to find me on social media, funnily enough, all you have to do is look for Wendy H. Jones. <laughs> I'm Wendy H. Jones on Facebook. Uh, if My author page is Wendy H. Jones author. My profile is Wendy H. Jones. I'm Wendy H. Jones on Twitter, Instagram, MeWe, Pinterest, anywhere. Any social media you're looking for me, I'll be Wendy H. Jones. Wow. Well, that that was simple. <laughs> I love. I I need to ask you: Have you ever snuck into a store where you know your books are and just autographed a couple of them? Uh, I have, but usually they they know me anyway, so they uh, they say, "Have you done it?" I've never done it abroad because I don't like to do it abroad. But I have taken pictures of myself next to them, and people go, "What are you doing?" And I go, "Well, I've wrote those." <laughs> <laughs> They've said, oh, will you sign it? But you have to get them to buy it before you sign it because mm. in case they do something daft with it, you know, like put it back on the shelf. Ah. <laughs> and yeah. you signed it to them. <laughs> right. And then it's then it's weird. Yeah, yeah. I I, uh, I actually, ha- uh, my books were at Barnes & Noble and I snuck in and I signed a couple. So they're autographed by the author. But yeah. you don't you don't see that until yeah, that's different that's until different. you buy it <laughs> yeah, that's different. if it's just got your name it's a different kettle of fish to put in two you know jocelyn very best wishes wendy h jones and then jocelyn doesn't buy the book you know <laughs> right and then somebody else gets it but you know people people like people like to know that they've got some yeah. connection with with the author have you ever considered Can I this say something before we finish today sure. as we record this it's world book day and World Book Day is for children, yeah? And mm-hmm. I have some children's books, which I have not mentioned, and my publishers will be after me if I don't mention them. <laughs> Please mention them. I have the Ferguson Flora Mysteries, which are young. They're a bit Nancy Drew meets Scooby-Doo. I love it. And the third one of that will be out soon. And I have a Bertie the Buffalo picture book. And the Bertie the Buffalo picture book also has a soft toy and a coloring book but with it and the second one called Bertie goes to the worldwide games will be out soon as well so I've actually got four books coming out soon <laughs> wow you're so prolific amazing I I'm so grateful that you've taken the time to chat with me about how you how you innovate as a writer but also how you help people step into their own writer's world and writer's personality that's so that's terrific and wonderful and I'm so grateful that you're doing it I would love to ask you one last question before we part. It's a question that I ask everybody who comes on the show, and it's a strange little question, but I find that it yields some poignant answers. And the question is this, if you had an airplane that could skywrite anything for the whole world to see, what would you say? Reading matters. That's what I'd say. Everyone needs to read more. <laughs> I love it. I'm I'm right there with you. I, I refused to read when I was a child until an English teacher gave me the Phantom Tollbooth. She said, you must read this book. And then Down a Dark Hall by Lois Duncan. You must read this book. Yeah. And I was hooked from then on. And I've, I've been a voracious reader since then. And there's this wonderful thing, actually. This is so cool. There's a there's an inventor who uh, he created something called the Little Sun. It's a solar powered little lamp that's shaped like a sun that the proceeds of which go to places to to bring these little suns, these little solar powered lamps to places in, in Africa and other places that don't have access to artificial light. 
and yeah. help kids read. That's one of their wow. intentions is to provide light in the evenings so that parents can read with their children, so that kids can read, so that we can all read more. So someone out there is also trying to do that exact thing, Wendy, trying to get more kids to read by giving them the opportunity to have light to do it by. That is brilliant. We Isn't are, that We're fortunate in Scotland because every baby that's born gets a baby box mm. and the baby box turns into a crib and it has everything they need to, for baby grows and everything. But they also get books so that their parents will read to them. Wonderful. Mm. What a great idea. I love that. That uh, wow, I didn't I didn't know about the baby box, but now anytime one of my friends has a baby, I think I'm going to have to figure out a way to get them a baby box with all well, of these things. The baby box it. comes from the government um, and it's basically everything you need. It's got baby girls, towels, a bath um, things to wash them um, you know, an outdoor coat, sheets, duvet, everything you need for your baby, including books. Wow. And, and I love that books are a necessary part, that they're considered a critical part of that. Wonderful. Yeah. Wendy, again, thank you so much for being here. I'm thrilled and honored that you have chosen to spend some time on the Innovative Mindset podcast. Thank you again. You're welcome. And thank you for inviting me. It was my pleasure. And this has been, as you know, the Innovative Mindset podcast. If you like what you're hearing, and I know you loved what you heard just now, so remember that you need to find Wendy H. Jones. You need to follow her, learn from her, read her incredible books, first of all. And second of all, I would love it if you would join me on Patreon. It is, remember, patreon.com slash innovative mindset. I would love to see you there. There are tons of really fun bonuses. Remember that as you go throughout your day, if you want to support the show, I'd be super grateful. Until next time, this is Isolde Trachtenberg, for the Innovative Mindset Podcast, remembering, remembering, no, reminding you to listen, learn, laugh, and love a whole lot. Thanks so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Please subscribe to the podcast if you're new. And if you like what you're hearing, please review it and rate it and let other people know. And if you'd like to be a sponsor of the show, I'd love to meet you on patreon.com slash innovative mindset. I also have lots of exclusive goodies to share just with the show's supporters there. Today's episode was produced by Zolda Trachtenberg and is copyright 2021. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, keep living in your innovative mindset.